Amen. <clears throat> I am not gifted with a good voice, but I will do what I can to be heard. I'm on. All right. Actually, the, the Bible is right on. Let, let our eyes look right on as we continue here in the book of Exodus. We've been studying the 32nd chapter in the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, a great book about deliverance. The Lord teaches us how to worship properly. Uh, just wonderful precepts in this book. And, and you almost wish you could eliminate chapters 32 through 34 because, I mean, Moses is on the high ground in the 25th chapter and he's up in the mountain with the Lord and he's learning great precepts and doctrines about worship. And chapter 32, 33, 34 is uh, the people in the valley of sin, as we've been reading through, has, uh, they made a, a golden calf in the beginning of this chapter the people got together and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And, and Aaron saw it, the golden calf, built an altar before it, the golden calf, and made a proclamation, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings, and they brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. And uh, we're seeing in the beginning of this chapter, as I have listed up here, the people's idolatry. The people's idolatry. And what we're seeing is, we're putting it together, that the idolatry was something that the people were pushing for. It was the people that uh, pressed, uh, had a democratic movement. They got together and they counseled one with another. Uh, the sheep decided that the shepherd needed to be led a different way. Moses was gone. They weren't sure what he was doing. So the associate pastor was there. The stand-in pastor was there. And they thought, we'll get together with him. And the people got together and uh, they took the Lord's name. And with the Lord's name, the priest, the associate priest, uh, put some new traditions in there. And they got idolatry plus new traditions plus the Lord's name. And they came up with false worship. And the Bible is about worship in spirit and truth. And the worship in spirit and truth must be delivered and revealed and directed by God who is a spirit and seeketh such to worship him in spirit and truth. And God was trying to do that with Moses in chapters 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29, and 30, and 31. But the people did not particularly like the way God was directing it. and They had a way they wanted to do it, but they still wanted to use the Lord's name. There's many things you can do in the name of the Lord. And the Bible wants to make this evident. God's not impressed with things in his name. That's why he magnifies his word above his name, because the word gives direction as to how his name will be carried about down here. The Lord was very upset with this. We see the Lord's indignation in verse 7. And the Lord said, Moses, go, get thee down. Thy people, which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made them a molten calf. They've worshipped it. They've sacrificed their into, And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. Now, now, you know, the Bible's a big book, and there's a lot of things written in this book, and we need to pay attention. And God repeats some things, and, and God shows us the sinful nature of our idolatrous hearts in this particular chapter. We, we were reading last week, and we uh, got down to the 14th verse, and where Moses had just interceded, and he stopped the Lord from letting that wrath wax too hot and burn the people up and consume them. And so the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And you can get the tape last week and understand the concept of how the Lord repents according to the Bible. We saw last week that there are certain things the Lord does repent of. He'll repent of his feelings. He'll repent of his thoughts. And there are certain things he will never repent of. And that's what he's written down in his word. And he never repents of what's written in his word. You can get the tapes and you can study those. Tonight I want to come to verses 15 and read a little through here and observe how the Lord was indignant and now Moses becomes indignant at what the people did as he starts coming down from the mountain. And it says in verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both sides, 
on the one side and on the other side were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. So Moses is coming down from the mountain. He's not coming down alone. When he went up, he went up alone. When he came down, he came down with the word of God. Moses was a prophet, a prophet like unto Jesus. The law was given by Moses in the hands of a mediator, he being the mediator, and God gave the, the tables to Moses to bring to the people. God had spoken them a couple months earlier in chapter 19 and 20, but now he's giving them in written form. This is the way God does things. He spake to Adam. He spake to Noah. Then he gives in written form to Moses, Moses being the first one to write the words of God down, the law, in the first five books of the law, writing the words of the Lord down. Now, so Moses is coming down from the mountain, and he's got the tables, the work of God, with the Ten Commandments thereon. Verse 17, And when Joshua, who was waiting at the lower part of the mountain, heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, as Moses was coming down to meet him, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And so, so what had happened was, back in verse 5, when Aaron saw it, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord, verse 6, And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink. That would be, let's say, their form of the Lord's table. And rose up to play. When they were done with the Lord's table, they had a worship service with music. They were playing songs. They were playing instruments. They were singing and playing music. They had a worship service that was built around, let's say, the Lord's table and music. And that was their worship service. As Joshua and Moses came down and heard this, it sounded to them as they were coming down, as they heard the music, like the noise of war in the camp. This is how the Bible's describing it, the noise of war. It's not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Now, in war time... You would often get two uh, battalions together, opposing armies, opposing forces. They would work from a hilltop, and they would work down, and they would meet in a valley. And there would be leaders that would shout the voice of mastery. They would lead on their troops with high battle cries and shouts. This was kind of the music that they were hearing, loud, shouting, screaming type of a music, a very loud, high decibel, powerful, like with a you know, good electric guitar and a good microphone, real loud, screaming like the sound of war. Or, he says, or the voice of them that cry for being overcome, like someone that's just been run through with a spear, ah, and he screams like that. You can think of a Led Zeppelin concert, ah, do -do 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 -do. you know, this screaming like that kind of thing going on. And that's the kind of sound that was coming. That was the music that was being played, like a loud rock concert type of a music. That was a type of worship service that was going on. God describes it as the noise of war. Uh, verse 19, it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, Moses, he saw the calf and the dancing. So it was that loud singing and that dancing. They were really getting into it. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mountain. Remember, Moses was a man of like passions as we are, like Elijah. Moses was a man that was known to have had a, a, a natural temper. You can read back earlier on, the first time he saw the Hebrew fighting with the Egyptian, how he took that in his own hands when he saw the two Hebrews fight. I mean, Moses was a man that had some passion and anger. He's angry here, and he might be sinning a little bit. Of course, the Bible tells us to be angry and to sin not. But, but I understand sometimes when a person steps over the line, uh, the Bible's recording it here for us. I mean, Moses is angry at this. God's going to teach him some things about how to behave later on. But I think even God understands his anger a little bit here because his anger on behalf of people taking the Lord's name in vain and, id and idolatry. Verse 20, he took the calf which they made and he burnt it in the fire 
They had a big uh, fire going on there. And he ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink of it. And uh, this uh, scene goes on here. Now, now I want to stop for a minute, and I just want to talk to you about, uh, since we're coming upon this here, this is the second time in the Bible that any form of music would be mentioned. The first time music was mentioned in the Bible in any way, shape, or form was in Exodus chapter 15. We covered it there. You might, just to refresh your memory, you can go back. It was after their deliverance, after they were taken across the Red Sea and they saw the Lord deliver them from the Pharaoh and his army, then sang Moses 15.1 and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, and then he gives the lyrics that they were singing in this song. It was a beautiful song. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. And it was a beautiful song that he sang. This is the second time we see any form of song or music mentioned in the Bible. So I want to stop tonight, and I want to take a look at uh, some things in the Bible about music and about songs. Uh, the Bible does not have a a real lot to say about music and songs. But there is sufficient in the Bible about music and songs that if you are discriminating, if you are discerning, if you are spiritual, if you study to show yourself approved unto God and pray, God will give you insight into the deeper things about music and song. So let's take a look at what we can find in the scriptures about music and song. The first thing I want to observe to you is um, in the scriptures, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And through the four gospels, you will never once, in words of red, see come out of the mouth of Jesus the word sing, sang, song, or sung. He never talks anything about singing songs in terms of a worship service to worship God in spirit and truth. Doesn't mention it. You will not find Paul talking very much about it because God is to be worshiped in spirit. He is a spirit. You must be born of the spirit, the new birth, and in truth. And John 17, 17, thy word is truth. And proper worship is word orientated. It is not song orientated. Okay, that's the first thing you'll learn. You read through your Gospels, do it on your own, see if you ever, Jesus ever used the word. Only once, only once in Luke 15 does Jesus use the word music. And it's about the prodigal son when he returns home and they kill the fatted calf and they celebrate. And there is music at that time for the return of the prodigal son. But never once does Jesus talk about worship and song and music being mixed together in the worship service at the church. Now, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but I want to show you some things from the scriptures about music because there is a tremendous imbalance in today's modern, carnal, Laodicean, end time, apostate church about music. As a matter of fact, the biggest book today about running churches sold millions of copies around the world. Pastors are flocking to follow it, is the Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren. And in his Purpose Driven Church, chapter 15, he says, I'm asked often what I would do differently if I could start saddle back all over. And my answer is this, from the first day of the new church, I would put more energy and more money into first class music ministry that matched our target. Match your music to the kind of people God wants you to reach. That's exactly what's going on in Exodus 32. And God calls it a noise of war. And it angered him. Now I want to show you what the Bible has to say about the difference between good music and bad music. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 26. Now, what you want you to understand is, and I'm an ex-musician. I was trained in music. I went to college for music. I studied music theory. I've analyzed music. I've written music, both original and written scores for uh, small bands, uh, sax, uh, piano, uh, trumpet, uh, flute, uh, four-part harmonies. Had to do it for studies at the music college. Um, uh, I just want to show you some things about music from the Bible. And the Bible wants to teach us a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to put some overlays up here that we can study along with. In the history of the scriptures, there are only three angels 
that are given names in the Bible. They come in this order. The first one ever mentioned is an angel by the name of Lucifer. He's mentioned for us in Isaiah 14 by name and Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel 26, where I stopped you for a second, and in uh, verse 13, which will give you an idea where we are just by looking at the number of the verse, because we know that the 13 is the number of rebellion. In Ezekiel 26, there's uh, the word of the Lord is coming to uh, the king and the prince of Tyrus. And the Lord is against this city of Tyrus and his prince and the king there. And what he's saying is, I'm going to destroy this city. Uh, verse 15, thus saith the Lord God to Tyrus, he's going to destroy this place. And one thing he says during the destruction all through here, verse 12, I'll make a spoil of thy riches. Verse 13, I will cause Tyrus, I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease and the sound of thy harps shall be no more heard. What you're going to find is that in the Bible, the Bible is going to speak of a type of music that is known as worldly music. It is the music of this world. The three angels that are mentioned in the Bible, Lucifer was, go to Ezekiel 28 and look at verse, I believe it's 13. Ezekiel 38 or 28, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden. This is the covering cherub, the anointed cherub. This is Lucifer. The garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering. The sardias, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Lucifer has a tabret and a pipe in him. Pipe for musical sounds, like a, a pipe organ, and a tabret for a rhythmic type of a sound. A tabret being a rhythmical instrument. And, and Lucifer was the angel in charge of worship. Later on in the Bible, we'll run into an angel named Gabriel. And in Daniel 8.16, uh, Daniel says, Make me to understand, Gabriel. And Gabriel is the angel in charge of ministering the word. And he was the angelic minister that, that gave the prophecies to Daniel and also ministered to Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, telling about John the Baptist, and then ministered to Mary, telling her about she would uh, carry the anointed Messiah, she would have the virgin birth. He was the angel of the word. And Michael, as we see in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 10, Revelation chapter 12, is the angel of war. These are the three main angelic leaders that God created a long time ago. Of course, we know from Revelation chapter 12 that when Lucifer fell, he took one-third of the angelic host with him. And one-third of those angels went with Lucifer and followed him. And God lost his worship leader. And his worship leader was a musician. And so music was created to glorify God. That's why it was created. That's why the first reference of the song is Ezekiel 15. Or, excuse me. Exodus 15. And the first reference there is of a song to glorify and worship God. Because that's the first music. But since Lucifer fell, Lucifer became known as, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the God, with a little g, of this world. He's also, Jesus refers to him in John 14 30, has the prince of this world. And as the God and prince of this world, he influences us in this world to do certain things. So much so that in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 4, you will see which is the chapter describing this world as it is and how this world came about. And, and we've studied this in our Genesis series. You can get Genesis chapter 4. That as this man Cain... Um, reproduced, having being a polygamist, and had wives and sons, and built a city, and Lamech took unto him two wives and was a polygamist, and built a city. We see that Lamech had a particular son, verse 21, named Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ. And Jubal is where you get the term Jubilee from. 
And the Jubilee is a big festivity with all kinds of music going on. And he has the harp, that's the stringed instruments, and the organ, that's the pipe type of instruments. And so you see worldly music here in Genesis 4. Who's behind this? Well, well, it's the God of this world, the prince of this world. Ezekiel chapter 26 shows that Tyrus, and uh, go back to where you were in Ezekiel 26 and Ezekiel 28. Of course, Lucifer is called the king of Tyrus. He's behind that city of Tyrus that has the noise of the songs that God says he's going to make cease one day. And the sound of thy harps shall no more be heard. The music of the world is a stench in God's nostrils. The music of the world is an offense unto God. It is, it is driven by the God, little g, of this world, the prince of this world, through the sons of Jubal, the ones that handle the harp and the organ, and they're to take your mind and your eyes and your ears and your thoughts off of God. So much so that uh, when I was reading one day through the book of Job, chapter 20, Job was observing this himself. In Job... Uh, Chapter 20 and 21, Job was talking about evil men. The 21st chapter, he gets into music. And in Job 21, Job 21, he says uh, about the wicked man in verse 7, Wherefore do the wicked live? I mean, why does God even allow this to happen? And they become old, yea, they're mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them. They have children. And their offspring are before their eyes. Their houses are safe from the fear. And uh, neither is the rod of God upon them. And that's right. God does not spank worldly people. They're not his children. God only chastises his own children. Okay? But God does not chastise the devil's children. That's the world. Or the sons of men. Then he says this. Um, uh, verse 10, their, their bull gendereth, they faileth not, their cow calveth, casteth not. They send forth their little ones like a flock, their children dance. The children of the world, the children of the devil. They take the timbrel and the harp. They rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth. They go down in a moment to the grave. And therefore they say unto God, depart from us. See, that music makes them not want to know God. Music is one of the ways that the prince of this world, the God of this world, blinds the minds of the children of this world from ever hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and keeps them from not wanting to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Makes the noise of the vials and the music and the harp that God says is a stench that I'll stop one day. Tyrus was a city that Jesus mentioned often with Sidon. Sidon and Tyrus. They were two cities up in the north. He said it's going to be you know, one day Sidon and Tyre will be judged tremendously. And they were Phoenician cities up north in the book of Genesis chapter 10. We learn that these cities, that the people from these particular cities are descendants of Ham. Genesis chapter 10, verse 15, Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. And the brother of the Canaanites, border of the Canaanites, was from Sidon. The Canaanites, the wicked Canaanites, the sons of Ham, were Sidonians and sons of Tyre that invented this music. It was a rhythmic, pulsing, jungle, beating kind of music that got you dancing. Once it got going, it was hard. You couldn't control yourself. Your feet started to, and you started moving. And that was the kind of music that was going on, a rhythmic, pulsing, African, Egypt, out of Africa, African, rhythmic Hamitic type of a music, a pulsing, hard driving rock kind of a beat. Even if you took uh, the melody and harmony away and just got that bass and drums going, there'd be enough of a beat that would get you going without any melody or harmony at all. This is the type of music that's the worldly music that we're descending into, that's becoming the universal language around the world. This is how the Soviet Union really came down. The truth of the fall of the Soviet Union, although there was a lot to do the way we, we took them on in uh, upping the ante in the arms race, one of the truths is they said, has the rock and roll music worked its way in and the kids got more and more of the rock and roll music, they became more rebellious to the Soviet way. Well, good for that. It's a bad way. But they, they also rebel at good ways too. It just puts a spirit of rebellion in them. 
and they couldn't control the, that next generation that came up, and that Soviet Union fell. That's what the Muslims are afraid of in their countries, that the great Satan, that's America, will get its evil rock and roll music into their children, and they'll rebel against Islam, and that would happen because it's a rebellious type of a music. It's the music of the world. Now, now this music is spreading all over the world, and the God of this world is behind it. Now, Jesus never spoke about using music in worship services or building churches around music. The worship of the Father must be in spirit and truth. You'd be born again, and then the Word of God needs to be the central point of the ministry. You must grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord, not in the music and the rhythm of our Lord, but in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And so much so, though, but the devil is trying to build something, and Daniel was given a picture of this. Daniel, to whom Gabriel ministered the word, showed a picture to him once. Turn to a Daniel chapter 3. As a musician, I can tell you, um, there, are, there are two aspects, two, two um, divisions. A song is divided in two major aspects or, or parts. There is the, the lyric that's verbal, it could be printed on a page, and there is the music, the musical aspect to the song. Each one of those two parts has three components to it. The lyric will have verse, and then it will usually have a chorus. And often there will be a bridge connecting the verse and chorus. Sometimes there will not be. be. The lyric will have two to three components to it. On the musical side, there will be often three components. There will be the melody. The melody is what is sung by the lead singer. You think of the song Amazing Grace. And you hear amazing grace, that's the melody. That's the part being sung there. Underneath that, if you were to open your hymnal to amazing grace, you will see other parts sung beneath the melody. The melody part is usually carried by the soprano, the highest voice. There will be voices underneath. There will be an alto part, a tenor part, and then a bass part comprising a four-part harmony. There will be melody, there will be harmony, and then the other part of the music would be the rhythm. And the rhythm will be the meter, whether it's in a 4-4 four, four time, 1, 2, 3, 4, or whether it's in 3 like a waltz, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, and the rhythm to it. And then, of course, there will be a particular, in the meter, a particular rhythm as to which beats are accentuated. And so you have music, you have lyric. Both aspects can be pleasing to God, both aspects can be a stench in his nostrils. You can have profane lyric that angers the Lord, or you can have holy lyric taken from the scriptures, taken from the Psalms, taken in a way from someone who's read the scriptures and puts poetry together in a way that the verse is pleasing, like Amazing Grace, which is a scripturally based song, or a song like And Can It Be, and you read through that, or a song like Hark the Herald, which is laced with scripture and scriptural, and the lyric is pleasing to the Lord. On the music side, you can have something that is pleasing to the Lord and something that is a stench in his nostrils, like what was going on here in Exodus 32. Taking the lyric away, the music made him sick. It was the rhythmic, sensual. Instead of being melody-driven and spirit-driven, the melody will line up with your spirit. The harmony will line up with your soul. The rhythm will appeal to your flesh and your body. And, of course, we are to be spirit-led beings. Worship should be in spirit. The rhythm is what drove us in the old days before we were saved. That's why any good producer knows you've got to lay a nice rhythm track down. No matter what the melody or harmony is, or if you want a good rap song, which isn't a song, you don't need melody or harmony. Just lay the rhythm track down and you can get them. That's a sensual, disgusting stench in God's nostrils. He calls it the noise of war. It makes him sick. It's driven by this creature right here. So much so that Daniel 3 is given a picture of what's going to happen in the end times when the Antichrist, Nebuchadnezzar, right here a type of the Antichrist, makes his idolatrous image, Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. 
and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Verse 2, and Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, etc., etc., and uh, he wanted them, verse, end of verse 2, to come to the dedication of the image, which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Verse 3, then the princes and all the folks came and all the rulers were gathered together unto the dedication. Verse 4, and then a herald cried aloud and said, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. So this is a worldwide unified movement going on here. To you it is commanded, people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the preaching of the Bible, at what time you hear the reading of the word of the Lord, at what time you hear the, indent, the um, intense, deep study that will be done in spiritual teachings, no, that, no, I must be reading wrong. Let's see, what's the fifth verse? At what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, and the harp, and the sackbut, and the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. That's the type of worship that the devil has, music-centered worship. Why? Ezekiel 28. He's set up with tabrets and pipes. He's not interested in the Word of God. He's not interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's interested in a worship service that's built around music. Music is the way you attract people. Rick Warren knows that. That's why he says the most important thing you want to do is set your church up so that you can, my number one answer from the first day, top money and energy into first class music ministry to reach out to the people. That's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. That's the type of worship service he's setting up. It's a music-centered worship service. Nobody gets saved by music. Faith cometh by hearing, not the rhythm and the sounds and the harmonies of God, but the Word of God. Amen. And that's why Jesus never mentioned the word song, sing, sang, or sung in four Gospels. But he talked frequently about giving them the Word of God and preaching the Gospel and going to the lost and going into the highways and byways and compelling them to come in to hear the gospel and to sow seed, which is the gospel. The seed is the word of God. You'll never hear Jesus talk about singing songs to people or reaching people with songs. Worldly music does that. Daniel 3, by the way, you read through here, and I think it's um, seven times it says the king had set up the image. This is a setup, folks. This is a setup so that you'll fall. The devil's behind this. So much so that when you turn to the last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 18, and God finally destroys Babylon, Revelation chapter 18, and this is, this is the end. I mean, God's finishing his work. The, the last trumpet seals the vial, trumpet, the vials, the last vial. The last vial is being poured out, and he's destroying Babylon. And um, he says in verse uh, 20, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Look at this. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. Notice the number one thing mentioned is the music. God's going to destroy the music. Babylon is false worship built on music. Oh, and secondarily, there's craftsmen in there. I mean, secondarily, there's idolatry. But you know what's become preeminent? Music. Even the idolatry took second place now. Music was the thing. Why? Yeah, that flesh loves music. You know, one point, I was, I was reading something very interesting. It was in Luke, no, Matthew 16. And Jesus said this. He was speaking to Satan here. He was doing, using the law of double reference. He does this a few times in the scriptures. And he says in verse 23, which is the number of death, 13 and 23, interesting numbers associated with Satan and his music and things. He says in verse 23, but he turned this to Jesus and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Now he's talking to Satan. Satan was kind of trying to fill Peter right there. And he's speaking right through Peter to Satan. For thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Satan has like a, he was a spirit, but in his perversion, in his rebellion, 
became kind of carnal and fleshy in his lust. He literally savors the fleshy things that men savor. He likes that rhythmic thing. He likes that fornicating thing. He likes that adulterating thing. He likes that drinking thing. He's really been perverted terrifically. I mean, he's fallen like a beast. And he savors the thing of men. And he drives this worldly music. Now, now you want to know something? So what? Who cares? It's in the world. I, I really don't care. It's in the world. Now, what I want to show you is there is good music. And there is good music mentioned in the Bible. The good music is, you know, we've seen it in the Psalms. You know, sing a new song unto the Lord. By the way, I always hear a new song, so I've got to write something new and upbeat and up-tempo, and that's what he's, somebody's trying to say. He's defining a new song as in Psalm 40. He defines it for you in Psalm 40. A new song to the Lord is right here, Psalm 40. This was written to the chief musician. It was a psalm of David to be played in the temple. And it says this, um, I waited patiently for the Lord. A amen. I wish we would do that instead of running off ahead of him. And it says, verse 3, He hath put a new song in my mouth. What does that mean? Well, here it is. He defines it. Even praise unto the Lord my God. Even praise unto our God. See, a new song is praise unto God. Now listen, I was a professional musician. Most of you probably weren't. So I spent my life in this thing. I can assure you, God is my witness. I didn't play any songs to God before I was saved. I played songs to the people paying my bills for money. I served mammon. What, what do you want to hear, ma'am? Which I could hear, sir. Just call out the request. I'll play it. What, what, what do you want at the party? What type of music? The concert wants what? It's a concert in the park. What did they want? Oh, the TV show wants what? And I, I played what the people paid for. I served the mammon. Or I played for myself. I didn't play anything for God. When I waited patiently on the Lord and I got saved, God put a new song on my mouth and I played songs I never heard before and sung songs like old hymns that I wouldn't give two cents or a nickel of my time to before I was saved. Somebody tell me to play And Can It Be? To like a song like And? Have you ever heard And Can It Be by Charles Wesley? Have you ever heard that hymn? It's a beautiful hymn. Not that I'm saved. It's a song unto the Lord. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? No chance I would sing that before. That's the new song that's put into your mouth. It's not some upbeat, toe-tapping, rhythmic, Watusi on stilts type of a thing, people jiggling all over the place, dancing. That's not what it is. It's a song unto God. That's the definition of a new song. In, in the uh, New Testament, in a few places, Paul will mention, uh, turn to Ephesians 5. I think we're having a minor earthquake in the building. Um, Ephesians 5. And in Ephesians 5, the Lord says that we are to, verse 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. He's contrasting the old spirit of the old man that liked to drink and, and would get drunk and go off to riot in excess and, and their anger would be more excessive and their lust would be more excessive and the music they listened to would be more excessive. But the contrast is, be ye filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God. This is the new song that you're singing. It's a melody in your heart that you can sing alone. You can sing that melody of amazing grace in your heart. That's the spiritual song. The melody lines up with the spirit. The harmony lines up with the, uh, the soul. And then the rhythm follows like the caboose. It's the last thing to come along. And there is a rhythm to God's songs. We studied it in Luke chapter 2. The beat will accent the first and the third beat, not the second and the fourth beat. And, and I'll show you that in a second if you want. But, but the thing is, this is what you do. Now keep your finger there in Ephesians 5 and turn a couple books to the right to Colossians 3. And you'll see how this is done. 
Ephesians 5. He says, to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In, in Colossians 3, he defines it in the 16th verse. How do you get filled with the Spirit? Well, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs of the, 19th, of the 16th verse lines up with what you read in the 19th verse. But the connection is the being filled with the Spirit of the 18th verse lines up with the word of Christ in the 16th verse. The way anyone is filled with the Spirit is being immersed in the word, which is why Jesus always talked about the word. What he knew was that if you had a worship service that is built around the word of God and you teach people the word of God, then what will happen through the teaching and admonishing of the word of God, the Psalms, which we teach from, the hymns and the spiritual songs will begin to sing with grace in your hearts. That's the natural outflow. But if the word is not center, then the danger is this. We're looking at a respectable, acceptable music to God is good Christian music. This is what we're learning here. Um, and by the way, I've noticed in every single verse, I never noticed where the psalms or the hymns or the music is the, the first aspect of a verse. It's always subordinate to something else. In the last passage, it was subordinate to being filled with the Spirit. In this passage, it's subordinate to the Word of Christ. Go to James chapter 5. In other words, music is never primary, it's always secondary. And it's always secondary to the Word of God. It's secondary to the Spirit of God. And here in James chapter 5, it will be secondary in this verse 2. It'll be in verse 13. And he says, is any of you uh, among you afflicted? Let him pray. You're going to be afflicted in life, you know. You're going to have downs in your life. Well, you're going to pray. And then secondarily, is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Again, I, I always notice that, that the singing is secondary. It's never primary. You don't build anything around music except false worship, false churches, or just plain old rock and roll concerts and jazz bands and orchestras. That's what you build. Jesus is building his church to teach them to worship the Father in spirit and truth, and he's doing it through the word of God, and secondarily will follow the music as a new song will be put in your heart. That's good music. As a matter of fact, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. I just want to show you again. It's mentioned in a verse, and it's subordinate. There needs to be a separation in Leviticus, between the holy and the unholy, between the clean and the unclean, between that which is good and pleasing to the Lord and that which is unacceptable and unholy in his sight. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul's teaching about uh, charity and prophesying and blessing people. And he says this in verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. You must worship in spirit and truth. And I will pray with the understanding. In other words, I, I just won't pray like a baby. I'm going to grow up and I'm going to have good prayers that have a good understanding to them. I'm going to learn what I'm praying about according to the word of God. Subordinate. And I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. Why? Well, because when I was a child, I spake as a child. I thought as, thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. When we were kids, we started out with little songs. Old MacDonald had a farm. Then we grew up and we got into the rock and roll stuff and the jazz stuff and we, we moved on to that. When you're a Christian, you start out with little baby worship choruses sometimes, but then you grow up into songs of understanding. There's a big difference between the worship choruses that are put up on the board here, which just have a few lyrics over and over and a simple melody, and the songs in that hymn book. You open the songs in that hymn book and the music is more pleasing to the Lord. The music has a better melody to it, and it has a much richer harmony to it. As I told you, every one of those hymn book songs will have four-part harmony written right in there. When I'm in, the, in an audience at a church and we're singing through the songbook, I'm reading usually either the tenor part or the bass part and singing it, reading it off the page because I'm a trained musician. And that's how you get harmony in the service. And we make melody together unto the Lord and we make a joyful noise to him. But these modern things are, are babyish. They, they have very little understanding to them. And we have to be very careful about them too because 
you know, the music is, is slipping too, and the rhythm is slipping. Go to Luke chapter 2. I showed you this before. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. There are four things mentioned that he increased there in the verse. Number one, in wisdom, mentally. Stature, two, physically. In favor with God, that's spiritually. And in favor with man, number four, that's socially. One, two, three, four. Uh, he grew in wisdom mentally, physically, spiritually, socially. One, two, three, four. God's music will accentuate one and three. It will accentuate the wisdom, the mental aspect, songs with understanding, and it will accentuate God, number three, the spiritual aspect. Take a, take a look at a 4-4 four, four song in most of your hymn books. A mighty fortress is our God. Notice the accent. A one, three, one, three. That'll be the natural accent of a hymn that's pleasing to God. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Take a look at rock music. It's got a backbeat. You can't lose it. Take any rock song. It accentuates two, the flesh, grew physically, and four, favor with man, socially. It accentuates the backbeats, two and four. That's how the world's music, how rock music will go. It's just that simple. Now, what do I say? I say, look, there's acceptable music. We just took a look at it. We did a little study in it. Let me show you the danger. The danger is Exodus 32. The danger is taking worldly music and bringing it into the place of worship and think that somehow God's pleased with it, and he thinks it's all right. We're just having a little fun around the church house. That's what was happening in Exodus 32. Taking the worldly music with the backbeat, with the rock beat, with the hard-driving, loud noise of war, like a man who's been run through by a spear, and doing that kind of thing, and bringing it into his house. God doesn't mind it in the world so much. He tolerates it. He puts up with it. He'll deal with it one day. That's his business. Bring it in his presence and call it, in the name of the Lord, we're doing this for Jesus. And by the way, those modern hymns that have that rock, driving rock and roll beat that I hear with the worship bands up there and the strong drums and the bass, when I listen to these things accentuating the two and the four beats, I notice there's not a lot about Jesus Christ and salvation in those things. It's usually about him, capital H-I-M, his, capital H-I-S, you, the one. Who is that person? Well, to them that are pure, all things are pure. But to Nebuchadnezzar chapter 3, He's going to tell you who him and the one is and the his is in about 20 years from now when he shows up. He'll give him a new name, and you'll all be singing it, Christians. It's that type of music that makes God sick. The Jews did that thing in the Old Testament. Turn to Amos chapter 5. Amos is an amazing book. You ought to read that about six or seven times. Most pastors probably can't even find it. But there's a book that needs to be read. Amos was the country preacher from Tekoa that God called and said, you better go to the chapel. That's the only time the word chapel is found in the Bible is in the book of Amos. The chapel. And here they had this big place where everybody was getting together with contemporary service. The only time it's found in the Bible, the book of Amos. And God's not pleased with it. And here's what he says about it. Uh, in verse, uh, chapter, Amos chapter 5, verse 21, they were having their biggest services at the chapel. And he says, uh, and it goes on nowadays too. Jesus said, by the way, look, you know the name of this place here? It's Grace and Truth Church. You know why? It's not Grace and Truth Assembly. It's not Grace and Truth Fellowship. It's not Grace and Truth Worship Center. It's not Grace and, Grace and Truth Chapel or Tabernacle. It's church. Jesus said, I will build my church. That's what he called it. Is it if, it's not, if it's good enough for Jesus, it ought to be good enough for you. He called it a church. We come to church. This is a church. And we're going to do it his way. Get my tape on uh, the must-dos of the church that we did a few weeks ago. By the way, that's a good tape. Every one of you should have it. Listen to it about seven times. How Jesus would build my church, he calls it. 
Here's what God thinks when you start dragging this stuff into his church. Verse 21, God says, I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. It's a stench. Though you offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings, your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. I will not hear the melody of thy vials. I like that, vials. It's vile to God. That's the danger. That, that's the danger. This is good stuff. You like doing Bible study? That's why there's only about 12 people here. <laughs> I'd like to go to a big church and do this one day. Not a chance. Not a chance. Folks, fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. So that's the Bible study on Exodus 32. Uh, verses 5 and the verses 15, 16, 17, 18. And that's, that's, uh, that's the spirit of the world. That's the spirit of man. That's the spirit of the serpent and the god of this world. And you know, in and, and that book of James, what was talking about singing, and if you're merry, sing some songs and sing the hymns and sing the psalms. But he also said in the earlier chapters, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What that means is, you trying to get the world to like you? Are you trying to win the world using the methods of the world and the means of the world? That makes you the enemy of God. That's enmity with God. That's a stench. He wanted to wipe them out for doing that. And just like you saw in the book of Ezekiel, there's a day coming the Lord's going to wipe it out. Just like you saw in Revelation 18, he's going to wipe it out. Come out from among them, or you may go out in the judgment with them. Wise warnings. It's a good book. It's a good book. A lot of deep stuff in this book. We must study line upon line, precept upon precept. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, pure and plain and uh, simple and straightforward teaching, Lord. Help us to uh, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, like at all those concerts. Help us to be filled with the Spirit, to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. And then, Lord, put a new song in our hearts, even praise unto Thee, the God that saved us through His great love, through giving His Son, Jesus Christ. Thank You for that salvation, Lord. Help us to worship You in spirit and in truth, for Thou art worthy. Thou art our Savior and our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.